so hell is a possibility in terms of space in terms of time hello and welcome back to nibble pop in our last class we had started with the invocation of paradise lost book 1 this class is going to be a continuation of that and we will be covering parts which deal with satan how he is introduced in the book then we will go on to see how milton describes the place where satan fell now before going into the text again i would like you to remember what we uh, did in our last class if you haven't watched that video i will advise you to go back and watch the introductory videos as well as the first video on invocation so that you get an idea of what i'm talking about in this video after we finish with the textual reading of the whole book in parts we will go on to discuss the themes different questions which are very important in understanding paradise lost book 1 and how as a student you are going to approach the text so let's begin with the text itself i'll continue from the part where we finished last day so milton is talking to this heavenly muse and he wants the heavenly muse to guide him understand what happened in the beginning how the story unfolded itself how the story opened up and here it's very interesting because he is not even considering the bible uh, as the source of his knowledge it is surprising because uh, usually a devoted christian holds the bible as a very valuable document here he is rejecting any literary piece as the source of his knowledge so this you have to keep in mind that milton is not just discarding classical body of knowledge as source of information but he is also rejecting the christian bible itself it is as if the heavenly muse has never told anything to anyone before it told uh, to milton yes he does of course say that the heavenly voice spoke to moses and he somehow believes that those words which which the heavenly muse spoke to moses have got lost in translation so he wants to recreate that a literary grandeur and that is why he says that he is going to attempt things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme so we will continue say first for heaven hides nothing from thy view not the deep tract of hell say first what cause moved our grand parents in that happy state favored of heaven so highly to fall off from their creator and transgress his will for one restraint lords of the world this besides who first seduced them to that foul revolt the infernal serpent so let me just stop you here we'll go back to the lines again he is setting his priorities here he is asking the heavenly muse to follow an order a sequence and he says that what is that sequence say first what cause moved our grandparents now here grandparent uh, doesn't refer to uh, literally grandparents of milton of course but the common ancestors of human beings according to the christians it is adam and eve so adam and eve were the grandparents they were the parents of uh, whole humanity in that sense because the whole humanity descended from them so what caused made our grandparents in that happy state so they were in a very happy state they were in paradise they were in eden uh, in company uh, of each other enjoying the fruits of life so what cause 
made them fall from that grace, fall from that blessed state. To fall off from their creator and transgress his will for one restraint. What was the will of God? There was only one restraint, one restriction, one prohibition. That is the forbidden fruit. So what cause made them transgress, go against God's will? Who first seduced them to that foul revolt? The infernal serpent. So the first two words which he deliberately uses in connection with Satan are seduced and infernal. There is nothing glamorous about seduction uh, if you think about it from a moral point of view. Seduction implies attraction, seduction implies coercion, deceit, all right. So the moment you hear this word seduced, you begin to associate Satan with something which is uh, not morally correct but extremely attractive because unless something is attractive, why would you be seduced by it? Now there are many uh, critics and uh, analysts of uh, Milton's Paradise Lost who begin to question the way uh, Milton is presenting Satan, whether he is supporting Satan and stuff like that. But if you keep your focus straight, you will notice that he is not denying the attractiveness of evil. He is not saying that evil looks bad, evil looks good, very good and very tempting. Why would it be tempting otherwise if it is not great to look at? So here from the very beginning, he is creating this dubiousness of Satan, the destructiveness of Satan. And he is associating Satan with Inferno. Inferno, in a layman's term, is very similar to hell. Okay, it is Dante's hell. It is the Greek hell. Now, while from the beginning he is trying to say that he is not going to be inspired by a classical muse, he is not going to be uh, connecting his knowledge to the knowledge of the Greek mythologists or uh, Greek uh, uh, body of literature, we do find him using words which refer directly to Greek mythologies. All right. Therefore, when he says infernal, he is borrowing the term of the classical body of literature which he in the beginning rejects or refuses to accept as his source of knowledge. Coming back to the text, he is talking about Satan. He wants the heavenly muse first to talk about Adam and Eve, what made them fall, and then he goes to the next part of his uh, query, which is the infernal serpent. Why serpent? Because Satan took the form of a serpent to tempt Eve. Therefore, Satan is the infernal serpent. He it was whose guile stirred up with envy and revenge deceived the mother of mankind. Guile is the quality of a very negative person who has no value or appreciation of honor or loyalty. So guile is kind of an envy which you feel it's a wrongful envy. Envy is always wrongful but this is even more wrong than envy. Uh, here Satan's quality is re-established as a guileful creature. It's not a heroic creature. So the first three words which you associate uh, Satan with when you read Paradise Lost Book 1 is infernal uh, who has lots of guile in him and who seduced Eve. Therefore, I don't see anything very positive and glorious about that. Satan in the 
very at the very onset of the book is not established as something which a morally correct person will aspire to follow okay deceived the mother of mankind what time his pride had cast him out from heaven now he is bringing you to the storyline so he has posed certain questions to the muse and then while answering those questions the muse will give us a kind of timeline the muse will start with the fall of satan and then eventually talk about the fall of man okay what time his pride had cast him out from heaven with all his host of rebel angels by whose aid aspiring to set himself in glory above his peers so what was the driving force behind satan's action the driving force was ambition not different from macbeth's ambition okay and uh, in case of macbeth he hardly had any followers uh, as we can see but in case of satan he had a set of followers okay so satan he was supported by his followers who also rebelled along with him and he set himself above his peers he peers means his uh, companions his equals so he was more equal than others okay by whose aid aspiring to set himself in glory above his peers he trusted to have equaled the most high so god is always referred as the most high as the most glorious as the most just satan wanted to go against this powerful force he trusted to have equal the most high if he opposed and with ambitious aim against the throne and monarchy of god raised impious war in heaven and battle proud with vain attempt notice the words impious proud vain so vain here has a double uh, sense to it's like a pun he is using here vain on one hand means something which is full of pride false pride so satan has a lot of false pride and vain also means fruitless so the battle which satan uh, fought in heaven which he started in heaven was a fruitless one was a vain one in both sense of the words of the word him what was the result of the rebellion him the almighty power hurled headlong flaming from the ethereal sky with hideous ruin and combustion down to bottomless perdition dare to dwell in adamantine chains and penal fire in a very short span of words he is weaving in front of you a picture of god you know throwing satan down and transfixes him into the deepest tract of hell you almost get the image of a comet falling down from the sky uh, with all the words like combustion and ruin right and comets we know have associations of, of very negative uh, mythological meanings in different cultures so after god threw satan down to hell he was bound up in adamantine chains and penal fire so the image of these chained up spirits in fire this image is the image of inferno which dante painted this is the image of hell which we find in the classical literature's description of the underworld so milton does take a lot from the greek epics more than he wants to at this point who does defy the omnipotent to arms nine times the space that measures day and night to mortal men he with his horrid crew lay vanquished look at the expression nine times the space that measures day and night what is he talking about he is talking about time in terms of space he is using the word space i mean he was writing so many years uh, before einstein's theory of relativity uh, of course he is not saying that uh, time and space is interchangeable or maybe he is i don't know that uh, a person inspired by heavenly muse can even uh, be a prophetic person you know he is 
giving you some information. Nine times the space that measures day and night. Space here means time. So, nine times the time that equals to nine days and nights. Okay. So, here you begin to understand that Milton is giving information and while giving that information, he is deliberately making you pause to rethink what he is talking about. Now, when you talk about heaven and hell and such cosmic uh, states of existence, you are not sure whether it is even an actual space or is it something beyond space. So, you don't know whether it can be measured in space even. So, this is how Milton is introducing hell as a spatial entity as well as a temporal entity. All right. We will come into that later, uh, especially in the way Satan talks about hell. We will come to that later. Nine times the space that measures day and night to mortal men, he with a horrid crew lay vanquished, defeated, rolling in the fiery gulf, confounded, though immortal. Now, Satan, being an angel, cannot die, poor thing. Uh, the point is, again, this, this is confusing because if you are a man and you die and your soul goes to hell, even that is immortal. Anything that goes to hell is immortal, not just because Satan is an angel, but because Satan is in hell. But his doom reserved him to more wrath. Wrath means legitimate anger of God. Okay. The anger which has in store for Satan more punishment. So reserved uh, for him here. What is that punishment? For now the thought both of lost happiness and lasting pain torments him. When do we feel sorrow? Sorrow is not something which you feel when you are in a constant state of pain. We feel sorrow when we go from a state of pleasure to a state of pain, a state of happiness to a state of sadness. So, sorrow comes from a particular change. I know like you don't feel sorrow if you don't have memory of anything which is less sorrowful or more pleasurable. Therefore, Satan's fall is more sorrowful to Satan, more of a punishment for Satan because he had tasted what heaven was like. Okay. This is very important because these are the lines where Milton, the man, reveals himself, his condition, a commentary on his life. I don't know if it is unawares, I don't know if it is deliberate, but we do see the man behind the book when we look at these lines. You know, the, the, the memory of that wonderful past when he, Cromwell, they worked together and had these high ideals of recreating society. Okay. So here he is not just talking about Satan's sorrow, but also the sorrow of any person who has memory of something beautiful. Okay. For now the thought both of lost happiness and lasting pain torments him. Round he throws his baleful eyes. So while Satan is laying on the pool of fire, he is not able to move himself because he is chained down. He just turns his head to look at what is around him. And his eyes are baleful. So look at the repetition of negative adjectives when Satan is referred to. Baleful is again 
uh, something which a person with a lot of envy and disgust looks at. His baleful eyes, he looks all around him. That witnessed huge affliction and dismay. Now you get to see hell through Satan's eyes. Interestingly, we never get to see hell through any other perspective. We get the glimpse of hell only when we look at it uh, from the point of view of Satan. All right. And what does Satan see? That witnessed huge affliction and dismay. Affliction means disease, wound, feelings of being hurt. So he sees all around him various sights which represent affliction and dismay, hopelessness. And now we will see what the hell looks like. Mixed with obdurate pride and steadfast hate at once, as far as angels can, it's an archaic way of uh, saying see, as far as angels see, he views the dismal situation, waste and wild, a dungeon horrible on all sides round. As one great furnace flamed, yet from those flames no light, but rather darkness visible, served only to discover sights of woe, regions of sorrow, doleful shades where peace and rest can never dwell, hope never comes that comes to all, but torture without end still urges, and a fiery deluge. Fed with ever-burning sulphur unconsumed, such place eternal justice had prepared for those rebellious. Here their prison ordained in utter darkness. And their portion set, as far removed from God and light of heaven, as from the center thrice to the utmost pole. Oh, how unlike the place from thence they fell. We will look at this description once again. It is a real place. Milton's hell, many people say that it's a psychological place, it's a state of the mind. Yes, it might be. For Satan, he rather, later on he says that wherever I am there is hell, I carry hell within me. But it is also an actual place. It's a dungeon. It's very similar to the places where Human beings are kept as prisoners. It's like a dungeon, but it's a flaming one. It's a huge furnace. So we have these images of fire and uh, destruction and the whole thing, it resembles a volcano. If uh, you were dumped inside the crater of, a, of an active volcano, you would experience whatever Satan was experiencing all around him. Yet from those flames, no light, but rather darkness visible. Now this is an oxymoron. How can darkness be visible? How can there be light and then no light? It can be, you know, there are different kinds of flames which hardly give out any light. Uh, just turn on the burner of your oven in the kitchen switch off every light it's a blue flame does it give a lot of light no it doesn't so all flames do not give out light so it is nothing unusual milton is not talking about an impossible situation that there is a flame but there is no light it's a possibility so he is creating bit by bit the picture of hell as a possibility as a real place because unless and until he does that, the place becomes less of a horror. When you know something does not exist, you feel less horrified. But he's giving you an exact map of hell as if. Although not in a very geographically concrete way, but he is painting the picture using real shades which you identify as possible. So hell is a possibility in terms of space, in terms of time. Okay. 
no light but rather darkness visible served only to discover sites of woe another meaning of darkness visible here is whatever visible whatever is visible through that flame is representation of darkness darkness here doesn't actually mean blackness darkness means spiritual darkness sorrow suffering all these things so darkness is also visible when it is hell or rather when it is hell the only thing visible is darkness what is this milton's obsession with darkness why shouldn't he be obsessed about darkness he is really struggling every day to understand the world in a very new way because now his faculty of sight is gone all he sees around him is darkness and through that darkness he can only reach sorrow so for him the hell is not just a space where satan fell he feels that his situation this darkness all around him this literal darkness around him is no less infernal than what satan felt in this yes hell is also a metaphoric existence okay where peace and rest can never dwell hope never comes that comes to all so he is personifying peace rest hope these are abstract nouns and he is using personification to make this scene even more relatable to mythologies but torture without end still urges and a fiery deluge so it's a flood out there and a flood of fire not water there is not a drop of water in hell and we know that water is a source of sustenance a source of generation regeneration and purification that water something which is used in a baptism baptism is a very uh, important concept in christianity where you get you know kind of elevated in your status in god's eyes so water is absent there whatever flood is there whatever lake is there it is made of fire such place eternal justice had prepared for these rebellious here their prison ordained ordained means uh, ruled or passed judgment so this was the order given they are going to stay here forever in utter darkness and their portion set as far removed from god and light of heaven now milton is talking about real dimensions what kind of dimensions where is the location of hell location of hell is very far removed from god how far from the center thrice to the utmost pole now this pole is not the north pole or south pole of the earth here pole means if you look at milton's cosmology you will know that the whole universe is envisioned to be spherical and it has a center and there is a pole and according to this statement the hell is uh, you know three times the distance between the center of the universe and the pole of the universe so it is totally out of bounds for any human imagination even to wander in oh how unlike the place from whence they fell now distance is also measured in terms of how different the two places are this place is so different from that place so they are poles apart so when you say poles apart you don't always refer to actual physical distance but difference in the condition so heaven is thrice removed uh, in terms of that polar length from hell because it is so very different from hell there the companions of his fall overwhelmed with floods and whirlwinds of tempestuous fire he soon discerns discerns means sees so satan soon uh, locates his companions who are overwhelmed 
who are confused by their fall because they are unable to move their limbs they are unable to get out of that fire and at the same time they are conscious of their paralyzed state satan looks at his followers and he locates the closest to him lying next to him and weltering by his side one next himself in power and next in crime long after known in palestine and named beelzebub to whom the arch enemy and thence in heaven calls satan with bold words breaking the horrid silence thus began he looks and identifies a rebel angel just weltering by his side lying by his side on the pool and that rebel angel is beelzebub now just the moment when milton uses the word beelzebub he redefines the word that the name of that rebel angel when that rebel angel fell from heaven was not beelzebub he was called beelzebub much later okay much later by the philistines okay he was the lord of the philistines and worshiped by them now this is where milton is introducing us to the concept of uh, rebel angels having been renamed by corrupt human beings it's like satan's name was lucifer he fell from heaven and his name became satan which means arch enemy great enemy or the chief enemy of god similarly beelzebub and the other rebel angels which he will be naming after this as in a roll call those rebel angels also had different names in heaven but why are those names not mentioned why is the heavenly muse not giving information to milton about those names because those names have been erased from the book of life there's this book of life which is like a register and just at the moment when these angels fell from grace fell from heaven these names were obliterated where you know they were like rusticated from the register so beelzebub is called beelzebub by human beings and milton is just using that name so that we can have an idea of whom satan was speaking to all right and in our next class we will be talking about these conversations between satan and beelzebub uh, we will take up chunks from these speeches of satan which are so important and the arguments placed forward by beelzebub to him and how they decide to go on with the situation what they decide to do after they analyze their situation in hell uh, i will advise you to go through the text up till now and ask me any questions which you might have which you think i uh, should have explained while reading of the book and uh, i will be uh, surely very happy to answer your queries in the description you will find links of certain articles which i have written uh, either in the website nimblepop.com or up pages you will have those links my advice is to go through those articles so that after we finish this reading of paradise lost we can straight away go to the thematic analysis and important questions related to the book all right so stay tuned for the next class hope to see you all soon bye